Is that laptop yours? All right, here we go. You make just one reference to it at the book. Yeah. Is that laptop yours? Uh, it's, it, you don't need the laptop. You got a book. <laughs> you got the book. It's all in the book. And I don't know. I, I truly... The, you don't know. The serious answer is that I truly do not know the answer to that. Did you leave a, a laptop with a repairman not in that Wilmington? I remember. Not, not that, that you I remember. remember. No. No. But whether or not um, somebody has my laptop, whether or not uh, it was I, uh, my was hacked, whether or not there it, it exists a laptop at all, I truly don't know. Are you missing a laptop? Not that I know of, but, you know, <laughs> you read the book and you'll realize that I wasn't keeping uh, tabs on possessions very well for about a four-year period of time. Here, he starts off by chaff and redirect. He just throws a lot of crap out there for you to bite at and see which direction you'll go. By that, I mean like a plane dropping a bunch of chaff and missiles taking off after it. He's dropping something and hoping you'll get there. He's very vague in his response, always an indicator that somebody is getting the opportunity to avoid the question. He disclaims, he, his blink rate goes through the roof when he's talking about that, and he, and he starts to trade guilt, saying, hey, I was a bad guy, and get off my back, in other words. Um, and then he does sacred space, a thing I call closing your body, and then milling, so it's barriering, keeping space between me and you, and then adapting, he's milling his hands. And then he does a whole lot of barriering in general. He's locked up pretty tight. If he's not lying, he's sure sending a lot of indicators that something's up. And if I were interrogating this guy, the heat would go really up. I would say, no, 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 no. You don't get to answer that way. You don't get to be free with this. You got to answer my question. And I'd poke and prod and push. And what you're going to see is you see that brow go up, request for approval. Anytime he needs something, and if you go back and find Leave It to Beaver and find Eddie Haskell when he's talking, hey, Ms. Cleaver, you see that forehead up. You see all that nodding when he's talking to them. All it, It's just classic. And we'll see him change his demeanor when he's talking in a different way. But for now, remember Eddie Haskell. Chase, what do you got? Great. I agree with all that. And I think uh, there's something off here in the first camera cut where there is an edit in there. And you can see it in the reporter. But I'd like you to check it out. Leave, let us know in the comments if you identified where the edit was. And when he's saying you don't need the laptop, you got a book. There's a book. There's some subtext here. You know what the subtext is? Go buy the book. I mean, he might as well have a screen behind him with his book on it. I mean, it's ridiculous. So the serious answer is that I truly do not know the answer to that. So this is double removal, a non-contracted denial, which means they say do not instead of don't. And did you leave it with a repairman? The reporter shaking his head to help him with the answers. No idea who this person is doing the interview, but I would bet money that you're going to see this again. And I would also bet money that if I had no idea who either one of these people are, that the reporter was either paid or trained to assist this person in the interview. And uh, not that I remember, said that twice with digital flexion on his hand. You can see his hand with his hand squeezing his other hand to try to hold himself still. He's very still here. And this is when he's being deceptive, according to me. And I want you to see what he looks like when he's not here in a couple videos, which we're going to look at. And he's saying, read the book and you'll realize that X, Y, and Z. So you need to go buy my book, go buy my book. I mean, that's the, the overall theme of this. Mark, what you got? Yeah, absolutely. All the same stuff. Uh, you know, there's a book out there. Go and buy the book. He's locked down. There's lots of self-soothing going on there. I baseline this about against him being on Jimmy Kimmel because I thought, okay, uh, primetime show, still a lot of stress, different kind of interviewer. It's a bit more fun. And so, yeah, we see him on the Jimmy Kimmel show. He, he starts to use descriptors more. Uh, he's more open. Uh, he's still a little bit locked down, but he's not locked down like he's locked down in this. So, yeah, he's really tight and secure in this one. Um, you know, the only thing he doesn't suggest is, is the, the, the potential non-existence of laptops altogether. I'm surprised 
surprised it didn't go down that route because he gets very, very close. I mean, you know, it, it could be my lot, laptop. Maybe it's not my laptop. Hey, maybe laptops ju- just are not a thing <laughs> in the first place. I was expecting he might push it that far, uh, mm. but he but he doesn't. There's this interesting strong gaze that he has as well. Now, he does show this in the Jimmy Kimmel show as well. But in the Jimmy Kimmel show, his blink rate is a lot more. He kind of locks his eyes very wide and tries to hold that gaze without any blink at all. Uh, Greg picked on upon some specific moments where he can't hold that open eye, that kind of locked um, uh, gaze that I think is there to kind of almost seduce the eye contact and get the attention and get the buy-in on it. And then at the end, uh, absolutely, Greg, lots of chaff and redirect, but especially at the end here where he says, look, everything was a little bit shaky at that time. And he introduces the hook of a much bigger personal drama going on. The drama for the interviewer, or certainly the audience here, is the drama of the laptop. He manages to move it across to a much bigger personal drama where everything was a little bit shaky. So interesting start for him there, which doesn't bode well for us really believing in in what he's talking about here. Scott, what do you got? All right. You guys covered a lot of stuff. Chase, I was going to talk about what you're talking about in the editing. I was, I was opening with that <laughs> because the editing on these things, all of them really bugged me to death. Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. guy, he isn't a TV guy. He's not good at this, but he's been trained. And we'll go as we go through. That's going to be the, the little thread this time that I go through pointing out the things where he's been trained and how he is the champion of Chaff and Redirect. The champion up to this point was uh, Anthony Weiner. Boy, that guy's good at that. I mean, you'll come in and say, what about this? And, I'll say, well, and it goes off in this whole other thing. But the thing that's similar with those two, with Anthony Weiner and uh, and Hunter, is when it gets to the to the important part about that laptop, he does the, the very same thing Anthony Weiner does. He starts talking about how it could be mine, it couldn't be mine, I don't know. We're listening to a victim. Everything he talks about goes back to him being a, an addict, about how he blames everything on being addicted to crack at some point during this. So he goes, I don't remember. You'll find out in the book, those types of things. I agree with Chase. Again, he's he's selling the book, but that's the reason he did the interview. That's fine. No big deal. He's selling something. Um, Again, his, his squeezing that hand is going to be, is part of his baseline now because he does, when he does that, and I believe he's been trained to do that because before I'm sure he was chewing on his mouth, doing all kinds of things and moving around a lot because you can see him controlling those, those little movements that someone will do when they get nervous or they, they start getting into things like I do. You're, they train him to, or he's been trained to, to sit still. And that's how he's doing it because he's not comfortable in the way he's sitting. He's all got his arm cocked over this way and he's leaning this way somehow. And it just looks odd. And it looks like it feels odd to me from where, from where I'm sitting. And he talks too fast when he's, when he's thinking about something, that's how you can tell when he's, he's creating something because he, he, he starts throwing out chaff and Port sort of puts his mouth over here while his brain is thinking and he knows what he's going to say. We're, we're looking at a professional liar here because he was a crack addict. And drug addicts, they're, they're pro liars and they'll look you right in the face and just swear up and down to everything you find valuable and you think they think you find valuable in, in your life. They'll swear to that from your religion to your kids to whatever it is, they'll swear to it. So as we go through this, I can't get my mind off that because I know that look. We all do. We've all talked to to, to people that are in that space. So to me so far, this looks like we're coming out of the gate. We're dealing with somebody who's who is really good at not at being deceptive. I shouldn't call him a liar like that. That's that's bad to come out of the gate saying that. But that's what I'm seeing uh, right out of the gate here. And Again, he's not a TV guy as we go through, and that's why he's looking uncomfortable most of the time. Scott, right. two things. What I, I agree, and, and the Eddie Haskell character, anybody who's an addict will be the Eddie Haskell character because they have to have two faces, one for authority and one for the rest of the guys. So I think that's yeah. part of it. And then the other one is Eddie Haskell. If you go watch the show, any of these guys, when they get into a point where they have nowhere to go, it immediately becomes somebody else's fault, something else happened. It's just, mm-hmm. it's why every time I watched it, all I could see was this character. So what do you got? Hey yo. Hey yo. Hey yo. Now you know what. 